Mighty Ape is Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore with everything from movies, music, games, toys, books, hobbies and more. Mighty Ape is your one-stop shop for the things that matter most. They constantly have hot deals and exclusive promos. And if you visit their website on the click-through banner on fakechef.net's homepage, then your purchase will help support Good Movie Monday. Mighty Ape, Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore. Good morning. Good morning. It is a good morning whether I want it or not. Please go away. Let me speak for the love of God. You're going to need a bigger potion. How do you feel about the beach, mate? Oh, well. <laughs> I like the beach. Every time I go, I lay down on the sand and strangers come up and throw water on me. <laughs> it's the sand that shits me. Uh, yeah. It's well, everywhere. I mean, it does get up there, doesn't it? But I'll tell you what, the sharks are like the least of my concerns. Because what if you need to take a shit? On the beach. Well, yeah. <laughs> when, what do you do? It's like that Caddyshack gag. You just go in the water. <laughs> and then the big brown shark came. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Damn it! Oh well, we're only um, we are a few weeks early, but this this is essentially Shark Week for us. Today's show is all about shark movies. I say a few weeks early because the Discovery Channel do have Shark Week coming up, and it's not too far away. Those people that you know hold off listening to this episode might be on time. I do know a lot of people who are obsessed with Shark Week and the Shark Week films. <laughs> well, let's why not start now and talk about shark movies. The reason is because there is a new shark film dropping this week called Great White. And uh, it's a survival of shark film in the vein of open water and 47 metres down. And what better reason to indulge? Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> First, the formalities. You are listening to Good Movie Monday, the weekly podcast presented by Fakeshemp.net, home of the nerdy cinematic ramblings. My name is Glenn Cochran. I'm the president of the Jabberjaw fan club. And sitting directly across from me is Left Shark himself, Ben Helwig. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm very good. How are you? Good. Do you remember Jabberjaw? I do. I love Jabberjaw. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of Googling after this episode. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably if only of... we could talk about TV, I would have been talk... I'd be talking about Jabberjaw. There's probably a lot of pausing and Googling. <laughs> what was the other... Because Jabberjaw was a Scooby-Doo ripoff. What was the other one with the car? There was one with, a ca... with the... where the... the car was like a moon buggy. I don't remember. It was like a moon buggy. Like a... Like a... It was like a buggy and the car could talk. <laughs> A beach bug, a beach buggy. <laughs> I have no idea what you're what talking, talking about. about. Yeah, right. It's a Hanna Barbera cartoon. Well, Look at it it's, up. A, it's a beach buggy, so it's related. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the program you are searching for is called Speed Buggy, and your fingers are still too fat for your keyboard. May I suggest Keto? Of course, uh, Great White is releasing this week. It's streaming on all the major platforms. And a bit later in the show, we're going to be chatting with the director himself, Martin Wilson. We're going to discuss the genre itself and a few other things related to sharks. And of course, an episode of Good Movie Monday would be incomplete without our regular segments. Our good mates will be dropping by to leave their mark on the show, which might be disgusting. But Jarrett Garn from Monster Pictures will let you know what's coming out on Home Entertainment. Guillermo Troncoso from Screen Realm has you covered with this week's movie news. And the chairman of the Australian Film Critics Association, Adam Ross, has a movie recommendation lined up for you. And of course, the Boneheads from Bonehead Weekly in America will be chiming in with their own take on today's theme. Should we get Jaws out of the way? Sure, let's do it. Because it's that's too obvious, surely. For, for a shark episode, it's too obvious to go with Jaws. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's nothing. what can we say that hasn't already been said about Jaws? We have spoken about Jaws many times. Yeah. And it is. it really is the... Like I think I don't think there is a shark movie that isn't in some way, <laughs> you know, ba- ba- pretty much a homage to to Jaws in one way or another. Unless it came before Jaws, that is, yeah. <laughs> but sure. I went looking for them, and they're not many. Yeah, no. And <laughs> when was Jaws made? When did the first one come out? Oh, uh, was it seventy four, seventy five? Right. Yeah. Um, but it, it goes without saying that there would, like you said, no no shark movie without Spielberg seminal classic. Not only the apex of shark movies, but Greatest film of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Like, it's right up there. Perfect. Yep. Um, but before we do start throwing personal recommendations at each other, let's take a moment to reflect on Bruno Mate's wonderfully awful Jaws 5, a.k.a. Cruel Jaws. Cruel Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> I do proudly own that on DVD. 
I probably should have done a bit more work for this episode. As I have mentioned in previous episodes, <laughs> I have not seen a Jaws film other than the original Jaws. <laughs> that still shocks me to this day. <laughs> and <laughs> and I know uh, I know you know people have strong feelings about the other Jaws, and like you know I'm a fan of Michael Michael Caine's house that he bought from doing his Jaws. How film. often does that fucking get referenced when people talk about Jaws four? Constantly. <laughs> Wasn't he? Was it? Was he? Because was he shooting Jaws when he won the Oscar? Won the Oscar? Yeah, that's, the, he that's could, the. He couldn't receive his award in person because he was making Jaws. I mean, I think like the amount of people who, who you see when they bring up the nomin the nominees, they rarely do they win. <laughs> but you see pictures like they bring up the still photo in the Oscars <laughs> all the time. Like it's not like such a a major thing that uh, someone wasn't there. But I guess it's unusual for the big. It's like the director of the best director or the you know, best picture, the whole best picture team. <laughs> like, oh, we we were off, uh, we're on holiday, so we didn't go to the Oscars. We didn't really, we didn't campaign for it savagely. Well, look, we might as well jump into some things and and talk about shark movies that we do recommend to people. But um, I have some really interesting ones coming up. But I, I want to hear your first cab off the rank. Now. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, my my first one. Uh, I, look, I thought, I thought uh, I'd steer, I'd steer clear for my first one. I thought I'd steer clear of um, kind of Jaws knockoffs, and I failed at that. Well, all of mine are Jaws, Jaws knockoffs. knockoffs, but at least I would steer, I'd steer clear of an American uh, Jaws knockoff. Few of mine are American. We might yeah. have a problem. We yeah, possibly. <laughs> my first one is uh, is Tintorera. So is mine. Killer shark, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so directed by uh, Rene Cardona Jr. Uh, this film stars Hugo Stiglitz <laughs> uh, from Nightmare City and Guiana, mm-hmm. Cult of the Damned, also by Rene Cardona Jr. Uh, he also directed well, the not, Bermuda, not Bermuda Triangle, Bermuda Triangle with Hugo Stiglitz is in, yep. as is uh, An- uh, what's it? Andres Garcia, who plays Miguel. <laughs> He's also in all of those movies, like... The- like uh, Rene Cardona Jr. seemed to like get together a, a uh, <laughs> kind of a, a troop, and they were in all his films. Mm-hmm. Um, Fiona Lewis, Fiona Lewis, whose body is really the star of the first twenty minutes of the film, <laughs> yeah. um, and so of course Susan George, uh, of course can't uh, can't uh, go past that. And basically, it's it it presents itself as a shark movie, and and Tintorera is the I think it's the Spanish. Well, Name for Tiger well, Shark. Let's uh, also or... say the film is also known as Tintorea Tiger Shark. Uh, ki- oh, and Killer Shark as yeah. well. Yeah, and Tiger Shark. Yeah, and it's more about sex than it is about sharks. Yeah, the sharks. The sharks <laughs> are literally the shark is like a, is almost like a spoiler. He's just the, <laughs> like the literally Hugo Stiglitz has turned up to. I think it's I, I don't know where it actually is somewhere near Mexico. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> to hunt sharks, kind of, yeah. but he doesn't really. <laughs> He only does it towards the end. He's like he seems to be interested in it, but he's not really. I love the fact that like um these two guys have like an obsession over a woman, and she goes skinny dipping one day and gets eaten by this colossal shark, and then they just go into business with each other. Assume she's just returned home. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. hunt sharks together. Well, because they that, well that's that's because they hate each other at the start. I like uh, Hugo Stiglitz is super jealous of him because he <laughs> like you know almost caught feelings for uh, and that's Fiona Lewis. Yeah, and then she literally. She bangs Andres Garcia. He's still asleep. She gets up. He's still asleep in bed to go have a skinny dip. Yeah. Gets eaten. And it's like, it's, they're pretty kind of cool graphic. Yeah. Um, like the kills are pretty Sequences good. Sequences are good, yeah. Although it, it's one of those, it's like, it is one of those movies where the human kills are pretty, seemingly pretty realistic and shot really well. And you're like, these are great. And then the shark kills are almost. Shocking because you're like, I don't know if these are fake. Well, I think is this the one that used a lot of footage from other shark movies? Well, it was a because the the movie is based on a book by a by a guy who actually you know discovered a breed of shark and stuff. Yep. So I think they may have cut in a lot of stuff. Yep. That he shot like he and he was on the film. He was the kind of the shark director yeah. kind of thing. But uh, fuck the sharks. Let's not forget that the second that this chick goes missing, they just fall in with another weird sex plot with twins or sisters. You know, he, they just because it's the seventies <laughs> and they just pick up chicks at the beach. But yeah, so she she goes into the water and gets in the heart gets eaten. Yeah, but no one like well she just disappears, so they don't know. 
like the audience are the only one know, that That's knows right. that there's a giant tiger shark <laughs> swimming around eating people. And most of the time, and in the shark's defense, most of the time he's just eating the other smaller sharks <laughs> that these fishermen are catching. He's yeah. not really, it's only until they present themselves, yeah. obviously. And it's not like Jaws. He's not a uh, malevolent shark. <laughs> That's, he's just doing what sharks do. Yep. But they, I didn't know that they, like they club a lot of, like they catch the shark and when the shark's nose pops up on the, they beat it with a that, stick. That is a thing. Yeah. Cause that's where the brain is. So is they, it, yeah, boom, straight. Yeah. So, and I don't know if they're killing it or they're just stunning it. Stunning it. Usually. It's what yeah. they do with fish as well. Cause uh, I mean, then it would just, because of, from what I understand with sharks, the minute they, they have to keep moving through the water because yeah. that's how the oxygen Filters. And it's one of the great tricks that they do in the movie. With every time they uh, the shark kills someone, all the blood streams out of its um, gills, and it's like this. It's a it's a great effect. <laughs> well, now you know what to do next time someone starts singing "Baby Shark." Yeah, club them. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but this movie, what I what I loved about, I mean, the the nudity is great. So the so the, yeah. So first they're kind of rivals for um, Fiona Lewis's attention. Then they kind of. You know, they get over that when she disappears, and they kind of bond over, over her, and yeah, and then they pick up, <laughs> pick up two chicks, and they have like he has like a weird, they have a foursome, yeah, and then Susan George appears, and they have a, like a, this weird, <laughs> three way relationship slash slash orgy, yep. kind of thing, and then they yeah, and that's kind of what leads in they they take her shark hunting, yeah, and uh, you know, kind of stuff happens. It's yeah. It was actually a really fascinating film. Like the nudity is great. Like Susan George <laughs> must is like would would literally win a Mister Skin Award for the most side boob <laughs> without showing boob in a in a movie. Like everyone gets their boobs, and she you know, does. Sometimes a good side boob is better than the real boob. The full boob, yeah. <laughs> and with, with Susan George, that may, that may definitely be the case. You know, um, the reason this film went sort of came back into the public consciousness uh, maybe within the last 10 years is because of Tarantino. Yeah. So, and there is a, there's a, the clip on YouTube of him presenting it in Mexico. Frustrating video because he's got an interpreter and he's only letting out like three words at a time getting interpreted. Right. Um, but yeah, that's kind of why that film has kind of come back into the, the zeitgeist of yeah. schlock. And I do, I have to say, I've got to track down the, um, the soundtrack by Basil um, Polidorus because it is... It is possibly the most 70s soundtrack I have ever heard, and it's great. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a, you know, and the shark, the, when, when one of the, I don't want to spoil it, but one of the main characters does get killed, and there's this, just this amazing scene of his, his legs, <laughs> like floating down to the bottom of the ocean with his intestines and stuff hanging out, and then the head in the shark's mouth swimming off yep it is like an amazing scene yeah that that's a filmmaker that knows what they're doing yeah yeah <laughs> well uh speaking of weird sex plots hey this is Jarrett, and welcome to pe class now it's going to be a pretty quick update this week and that's because there's only one distributor releasing one new movie on home entertainment but rather than get right to it i'm going to pad this fucker out with a little bit of news so first up, Umbrella Entertainment will be releasing Brian Trenchard by my book Smith's Turkey Shoot on Blu-ray on September 1st. Now this will be part of Umbrella's Osploitation Classics line, which means you'll get a slipcover, special features, and hopefully a new 2K or 4K restoration of the film itself. Now as Brian would say, buy my book. On that very same day, Umbrella will also be releasing a new title in their Sunburnt Screen series with Nadia Tass's The Big Steel. Now this will have a 4K restoration, no doubt new special features as well as a bunch of archival special features from the previous DVD and a snazzy little slip cover. Then in some unfortunate news, the 4K UHD and Blu-ray of Basic Instinct have been bumped a month to August 25th by Universal Sony and Studio Canal. No real reason known because the film did come out on all formats in the UK last week. In fact, my copy is already in my hot little hands and I can't wait to watch it this weekend. Then, some other news from Universal Sony Pictures and Studio Canal is that Guy Ritchie's Wrath of Man is getting a Blu-ray and DVD on August 11th. Now, unfortunately, this isn't going to get a 4K UHD, but that's the case in the States as well, which is really unusual as Lionsgate are distributing in the States and they're very fond of the format. Anyway, that's it for the news. Moving on to this week's sole release. 
From Roadshow, we've got The Courier coming out on Blu-ray and DVD. This film had a brief theatrical run and it's a true story thriller that concerns the Cuban Missile Crisis and stars Benedict Cumberbatch. Anyway, that is it for me for this week. Until next time, stay physical. Jared Garn, one of the guys from Monster Pictures and Monster Fest, the man obsessed with physical media, the guy who single-handedly keeps 4K Ultra HD and Dolby Atmos Industries in business. <laughs> Visit Monster Pictures and Monster Fest on social media pages and keep up with that guy. Ben, the problematic thing for me when it comes to shark movies, and this is what we're getting at before, is that there's no new ground to cover here. Like, it's just the same old, same old, and it's either a survivalist shark movie, community and peril shark movie, or mutant sharks, like, you know. So, probably comes as a shock to most people that I'm not going to cover any of those asylum type of movies on this episode. I'm not going to do the Mega Shark franchise. I do love the Mega Shark franchise. I'm not going to do Sharknado or any of those other ones, but um, I do respect anything that has Coronemic in it. <laughs> Parker Lewis can't lose. Mate, sand sharks. Ice sharks, great stuff. Jim, oh, that's actually one I forgot to do was the um, Jim Wynorski film, the Women's Prison Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre. <laughs> that's because you've done it before. I have talked about it. <laughs> I have talked about it before, <laughs> uh, but I just I didn't even think of it. Yeah, well, well it was mate, a major mistake. <laughs> Tracy Lords is in. You're off your game. <laughs> but I, I done fucked up, Dad. Well, let's. This is interesting. We we cross streams on the last one. It'd be interesting to see if we do again. So, what what is your choice? <laughs> My next one is uh, uh, <laughs> from 2012. Nah, not mine. Okay, not yours. It, maybe it's in it. I mean, it could be in a different order. But it's from 2012, it is Bait or Bait 3D, as ah, it is sometimes known. Yes. The uh, infamous shark in a supermarket movie, directed by Kimball Rendell. Directed by Kimball Rendell. Originally was supposed to be directed by Russell Mulcahy, who co-wrote the script, but um, he had a conflict with the Teen Wolf TV series. Yeah. And so handballed it onto Kimball. He's a producer on it, I think. He's a producer on it. And he's like the they don't talk about it much in the I did watch the extra features on the Blu-ray have they've got a pretty good there is a pretty good um, making of Doco on it, but yeah. uh, they don't mention uh, this stuff, the yeah. the whys. But um Yeah, it's pretty good. It stars um okay. <laughs> Xavier Samuel, who from a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this film, Adore, yeah, yeah, the yeah, movie yeah. where the sons, he's one of the sons who, ba- like they, <laughs> so it's, it's Robin Wright and she bangs her best friend, Naomi Watts' son. Yep. So <laughs> Naomi Watts uh, gets really upset about it and then he's comforted by Robin Wright's son, who bangs him. <laughs> like it's a great, <laughs> it's very, I mean, if they did it on a boat with a shark, it would be Tintoria. <laughs> <laughs> It's great, but there's also um, uh, Shiny Vincent. Uh, there's a lot of Home and Away kind of Home and Away and uh, Neighbours. It cast technically is an this. Aussie film. Yeah, it, okay, totally. It's shot. It's shot in Australia. Yep. It's full of Australian cast. So Shiny Vincent, Phoebe Tonkin yep. from H two O, and uh, Kerry Behind from H two O, Julian McMahon, Martin Sachs from Blue Healers. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's the Blue Healers connection yeah. again. My, uh, I do if I if I can ever get uh, crime capital of Australia Mount Thomas into a conversation, <laughs> I will. Boy, do you ever! Uh, Lincoln Lewis, the son of the uh, yeah, you know, rugby great um, Wally Lewis, and uh, you know he got into a bit of trouble over a sex tape uh, apparently uh, at some point. Uh, but yeah, this is a it's an interesting movie. Like uh, it's fun, it's fun. Yeah, like it's it's a it's a great idea. I remember seeing that that. Um, I'm not sure if it was based on this or not, but there was that, and it's turned out that the image was fake, but they had the escalator going down into the flooded yep. uh, shopping center with the shark swimming in, in, the, bottom. The, in the bottom. Um, you know what and, I found a bit hypocritical is a lot of people that dissed this film when it came out are the same people that jumped on board that fucking Sharknado when it came out. You yeah. know, like, But I think Sharknado was... Like, Asylum is intentional. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of the fans sort of, you know, didn't know what Asylum was. They just saw a stupid shark movie and they went along with it. Yeah. Bait is a stupid shark movie, and it's much better. It's much better. And, well, Bait's saving grace is that it made a gazillion dollars in China. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas, um, I don't know. I mean, Sharknado actually did really well. Like, it was the movie that made Asylum, really. Kind of. Um, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, all and all of those mega shark versus mm. thing and uh, stuff, you know, like, were super popular on... on they were Walmart. It made more Walmart money. Staples. Made more money for them than the mockbusters that they're actually famous for. Yeah, yeah. But do you remember? I think this is either we've spoken about it on the show, or I've got severe case of deja vu. 
But when this film came out and Margaret Pomerantz reviewed it and she gave it a near perfect score, she's like, this is like three three stars or three and a half stars. And then there's a disclaimer at the end. She goes, my best friend is friends with the director. <laughs> And look, I've met, and Kimball is a lovely guy. He, like, he's a really smart guy. He's been on the show. He's been on the show. He is the director of Cut. Yep. Uh, and he was also in the Hoodoo Gurus and the XL Capris. Yep. Uh, so he's, he's Australian rock royalty, basically. Got a lot of time for him. Um, and like, yeah, the movie is is incredibly watchable. Yep. Like it is, and it is, like, you know, you know what it is before you get into it. And it, it is a lot of fun. Well, it's the original Sharknado because the the was it, was it a tidal wave that, that a, yeah, smashes like, into yeah. the city and the sharks all come in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, completely. The thing that I don't get, like the opening, the opening scene of the film, the opening scenes, and this is there. There are some definite kind of script questions. Yeah, but the the opening scene is like so. Xavier Samuel and Shani Vincent are going to get married. Mm-hmm. Like that's the kind that's their relationship at the start of the thing. And then Shani Vincent's brother, who happens to be Xavier Samuel's best friend, like takes his, sh- they're li- like their lifeguards or whatever, yep. takes his shift to go set this boy. And while he's out there, a uh, great white shark turns up and he gets killed. And <laughs> somehow, because he took Xavier Samuel's kind of shift, Xavier Samuel's is like guilt ridden <laughs> and they like he Should and Shani me. Vinson break <laughs> like he's got like survivor guilt yeah. and you're like of, of the random <laughs> like acts that can happen it's such a weird thing to be like I can get it like you'd feel I mean you feel bad your best best mates died yeah. but to feel that guilty no, that you'd be you, like thank fuck it wasn't me like and he gives up like he's I don't know, they're, they're going off to Singapore they like they have this whole life plan that he's not a lifeguard and for his life to go so completely down the toilet that now he's at job is stacking shelves at a supermarket, yeah. which admittedly pays really fucking well if you're doing it at night and stuff. Like yeah. it's a good, yeah. if you've got, if you, it's as a side hustle, it's a great gig. Mm. Um, Mate. Well. You know, like the rest of the movie is, you know, what is Julie McMahon is, is super charismatic in it, which, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't think was kind of possible. Uh, everyone, everyone is, Good. Like Lincoln Lewis is is a jerk, and there's a there's a great like there's a lot of great tension involving the little dog. Yeah, yeah. That um, Kruber Hine has. It could have used it could have used some more bikinis. <laughs> I mean, that is a like Tinteria has is. It did like, look pretty cold though. It does. Well, it, it, it totally is. Like it's <laughs> a it's a you know, and they're but they're all. I mean, they're all wearing supermarket clothes. They're not wearing beach clothes. I mean, it isn't set on the beach. <laughs> Therefore. Bikinis so are bikinis are not out, but like <laughs> Tintorera, like that is some great seventies boobs, some great seventies uh, bikinis. Everything I talk about has great seventies um, bikinis and boobs, and or if not eighties, but I, like um, it's one of the things that I look for in a film. Well, let's uh, trip back to nineteen eighty one. This one was really right in the ways of Jaws, a movie that not only cashed in on Jaws, but it's like the cinematic equivalent of the you know the credit card swipe machines that carbon copy that's what this movie is like this is so jaws it goes by several names in america it's called great white uh the british know it as shark and um most people probably know it as the last shark and well i've never heard of this this film. one stars vic moreau Excellent. playing the robert shaw character with his head attached with his head attached he's playing the robert shaw Quint character. He's got the same costume. He's got the same gravelly voice. It's that he's the seasoned shark hunter. Obvious he is, and he does like he he picks up a surfboard that's got teeth marks in it. But these are perfect teeth marks that have been done by like a Stanley knife, right? Yeah, right. And he's just staring at this thing for about a minute, like just staring at it. And the camera just keeps zooming in on his face, and he's staring at it. It's like yeah, you know, we get it, mate. But he's doing all these complex facial expressions as if he's concerned. It's like. Man, overacting like you've never seen. Uh, John Sinclair's <laughs> in it too, but there's no point me telling you the plot because it is Jaws. It's so Jaws. we're talking about the the resort town. We're talking about the mayor that just wants to keep things open. We're talking about the sheriff. We're talking about, um, like I said, the seafaring hunter. Is there a, a Richard Dreyfus? Uh, kind of. There's a character that's sort of in his place, not the same kind of character. And does the Richard <laughs> Dreyfus character <laughs> cuckold the, the sheriff character <laughs> like in the book? Of Jaws that they cut out <laughs> of the film. That's a good question. I might have to revisit yeah. it again. And I'll happily do it. I'll happily do it. Uh, this one, when it was released, um, by, uh, I can't remember who released it, but Universal Pictures sued the distributors, including the Australian exhibitors, and it got yanked from from theatrical cut, like from the actual screening. Like it just completely disappeared and just didn't return for many, many years until home video. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's it's, it's up on YouTube for all to see in a pretty good print. Like the, the, the copy of it's pretty good. Um, I think this one's cut so much from the same cloth of Jaws that it could easily slide in as a sequel. You know, yeah, right. If this had, say they never made Jaws Revenge and this just got released with Jaws 4, you'd buy it. Like you would go, yep, this is Jaws 4. Yeah, you know, right. Because by the time you get to number four, it's going to be a cashing, you know. You don't expect any of the original cast no. to return. And the production's good enough that it could I mean, be Jaws 4, you know. Half it's, of them got... It's not as shonky as like an Italian kind of, you know, cruel, cruel Jaws or anything like that. It's actually got a little bit of production value to it. So, you know, it could have been... An official Jaws. In fact, in China, it was called Jaws 5, I think. So, right. There you go. Well, they, I mean, they know how to release a film in China. <laughs> if you've never seen Great White, a.k.a. The Last Shark, YouTube it. Hey, what's happening, everybody? It's Guillermo here again from ScreenRealm.com, Australia's favorite entertainment website covering all things movies and television. As usual, I'm here to cover a little bit of the news that's occurred in the past week. Kicking off with a good amount more on the seventh film in the Transformers franchise. It's officially entered production. Through a virtual showcase presented to the media, Paramount revealed that the official title for the next Transformers film is Transformers Rise of the Beasts. As fans will know, the Beast signifies a clear expansion to the live action franchise, bringing in various characters from the Beasts Wars Transformers spin off series. Optimus Prime will once again be the primary hero on the Transformers side of things with a primary story strand that will this time introduce the fight between Beasts Wars and their natural enemies, the Predacons. The Autobots and the Maximals will have to save the world from another new threat, the Terracons. Two of the film stars, Anthony Ramos from In the Heights and Dominic Fishback from Judas and the Black Messiah, were also at the virtual showcase and shed some light on their characters. Ramos said his character, Noah, is an electronics expert and military vet living in Brooklyn, comes from a lower income home, and is always about taking care of the people he loves, serving as a bit of a father figure for his younger brother. Fishback described her character as an intelligent artifact researcher who works at a museum, a woman trying to start her own path and leave a workplace where her boss keeps taking credit for the work she's done. The film is to be directed by Creed II Helmer Stephen Capel Jr. and is currently scheduled to open in the US on the 24th of June 2022. Oscar nominees Brian Cranston and Annette Benning will be starring together in Jerry and Marge Go Large, an upcoming comedy based on a surprising true story. Set up to be an original film for Viacom CBS owned US streaming service Paramount Plus, Jerry and Marge Go Large is inspired by the true story of Jerry and Marge Selby, a retired Michigan couple who found a mathematical loophole in the Massachusetts lottery. Winning around $27 million through various games, the couple went about using the money to help revitalize the small town of Evart, which has a population under 1,800. Attached to direct the film is David Frankel, whose credits include The Devil West Prada and Marley and Me. The screenplay adaptation of a Huffington Post article was penned by Brad Copeland, whose credits include Arrested Development and Spies in Disguise. Cameras on Jerry and Marge Go Large begin this July in Georgia. And get ready for Wolf Creek 3, a third film in the Aussie horror slasher franchise is on the way, with Altitude Film Sales announcing it as worldwide sales rights outside of Australia and New Zealand. The third Wolf Creek will be bringing back John Jarrett as notorious serial killer Mick Taylor, who this time has set his sights on an American family on vacation in the Australian outback. The couple's two children managed to escape, but Mick isn't far behind. On board to direct is Rochelle Wiggins, making a feature directorial debut following a number of producers slash production designer credits in the short film space and an art department credit on Ridley Scott's Alien Covenant. Wolf Creek 3 screenplay comes from Duncan Samarasinghe, and I hope I've said that surname right. Greg McLean, creator and director of Wolf Creek 1 and 2, will be producing the film via his Emi Creek Pictures banner. Production of Wolf Creek 3 will begin in South Australia in late 2021. Jake Gyllenhaal and Vanessa Kirby will be stranded together on an island in a survival thriller. Titled Suddenly, the project is an adaptation of a French language novel by author Isabelle Atassier. The story tells of a couple who find themselves in a fight to survive when they are stranded on an island. The novel casts a light on the dynamic of this relationship and it also holds a mirror up to the modern society. Jake Gyllenhaal is also attached to produce the film, which will be the sophomore directorial effort from acclaimed French screenwriter Thomas Bedigan, known for a prophet, Rust and Bone, and Deep Pan. And Jerry Seinfeld will be starring, directing, and producing a Netflix comedy film titled Unfrosted. Seinfeld also co-wrote the screenplay for the film, which is inspired by a joke he told on the stand-up stage about the world-shaking invention that is Pop-Tarts. Seinfeld said to Deadline, the outlet that reported the news, Stuck at home watching endless sad faces on TV, I thought this would be a good time to make something based on pure silliness. So we took my Pop-Tart stand-up bit from my last Netflix special 
and exploded it into a giant crazy comedy movie. Production on Unfrosted is expected to begin in the US next spring. That about covers me for another week, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks as always to the Good Movie Monday team for having me. And be sure to go to ScreenRealm.com for your latest movie, TV news, trailers, all that jazz. We've also got the latest streaming schedules for Netflix, Stan, and a lot more. I'm out of here. Sharks patrol these waters. Sharks patrol these waters. Don't let your fingers dangle in the water. And don't you worry about the day glow orange life preserver. It won't save you. It won't save you. Swim for the shore just as fast as you are able. Swim like a motherfucker. Swim. shifts to now, the ever-glorious now, the ever-present now, dredged in flour and deep fat fried and cooled on paper towels and then devoured. You know, I spent 15 years in a life raft, 15 years in a life raft, now I got something to say, stay in your lifeboats, people, stay in your lifeboats, people, it's murder out there, murder out there, sharks patrol these waters. Sharks patrol these waters. Hey, don't you worry about the Deglo Orange Life Preserver. It won't save you. It won't save you. Swim for the shores just as fast as you were able. Swim. Sharks Patrol These Waters by Morphine. That's a grass little track, short and sweet. Speaking of short and sweet, before that, Guillermo from Screen Realm. Visit ScreenRealm.com, dive into his world and see what he's all about. Um, here's, a good, uh, here's a good shark tie-in for today's show, Ben. All right, so usually we eat dinner together you know, before a show. Very popular food amongst us is flake. Mm, do love a bit which of flake. Which, of course, is gummy shark. So um, you might even say we're shark experts. So, yeah, certainly. <laughs> Marine certainly, fucking biologist, yeah. mate. <laughs> and I tell you what, I never have a Sunday without a bit of flake. <laughs> yeah, mate, we know all about the subject. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's a weird segue to today's interview. Um, but here we are, nevertheless. And uh, Martin Wilson is a director of television and uh, commercials. And he's done some uh, pretty big commercials, actually. He's, he's done, you remember the, um, oh, the one punch campaign that was done with uh, Danny Green, the boxer? That was a big one. He oh, was did, that the Coward Punch Coward thing? Punch one. He, he did that. He, um, he did a Samsung campaign that was very popular. And this would be his, uh, his first feature film in over like 30 years of making all those commercials. So uh, the movie is, as I said, hitting major digital platforms this week on June 30. And if you're a fan of those survivalist movies like Open Water and The Shallows and 47 Meters Down, then this is another entry into that genre. So let's take a listen and we'll catch you on the other side. G'day, Martin. How are you, mate? G'day, Glenn. I'm very well, very well. You've, you've spent over 20 years making short films and commercials. So why a shark movie for your first feature? Can you tell us how this one came about? Well, it, it came about through the producers, Michael Robertson and Neil Kingston, who knew me through commercials. So often you get your opportunities and your big breakthrough, people that you've formed relationships and, and um, who trust you over all these years. So after many false starts and many... Um, False Dawns, which I'm sure many people can relate to in the, in the directing game, that I finally got my opportunity. And it, it happened to be a, a shark film, a genre film. But of course, I love uh, genre and I love genre films. And that's the type of movies I want to make. So you, you, jump, you jump in, you know, head first. 
Yeah, for sure. And shark survivalist sort of story has become a genre onto its own um, over the last 15 years at least. Uh, were, you, were you a fan of this specific genre? Yeah, I was. I mean, I, I, of course, everyone who's a, a filmmaker, oh, a majority of people love Jaws. I mean, it's such a high watermark and such a great movie for for so many reasons. And yes, I was a I was a fan of 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 that film, and I liked The Shallows. Too. I thought that was a great film, and Forty Seven Meters Down. I mean, I enjoyed that as well. So there's been some good additions to that shark survival genre, and, and I definitely definitely would watch those movies and I definitely enjoyed them you know they're, they're good they're good character you know they've really added a bit of um solid character um to these types of I suppose the horror and and the suspense as well which um elevates those movies for sure and I, I noticed that quite a few of your producers have for lack of a better word quite a pedigree in in the creature feature you know sort of genre um did that help Oh, I think any, you know, all that level of experience, you know, um, definitely helps, um, you know, and they can guide you along the way and what works and doesn't work. So absolutely, um, you know, it's a miracle any movie gets made in the first place. So the fact that, you know, you have people that are, you know, well versed in the genre and understanding is a huge help for any director and in particular first time feature director. Sure. And, and as, as for the, the genre itself do you think aussie audiences react differently to these sort of stories given our relationship with sharks i think people just you know they it's it, you know they i think they enjoy them i think you know the fact that um it's it's not they're living through vicariously through the characters which is a lot of why people enjoy horror um you know that vicarious thrill um and i think because we are you know, surrounded by water and we're so versed in in living and growing up in water. You know, I think there's a fascination in sharks in Australia as there is as much as there is around the world. So yeah, I think, you know, even the audience that we had last night, you know, people were, you know, uh, enjoyed <laughs> the visceral nature of the, these types of movies and, you know, out, out in the water. I think we I think we get it. Yes, absolutely. And and speaking of that, do you did you shoot much of this on the open water? How much was studio? How much was open water? A lot was open water, um, and you know, it, and obviously everyone knows the limitations and the and how hard it is when you're shooting in the elements and on the water. So we had 25 days, um, and yeah, you've got tides, you've got the wind, you've got rain, you've got uh, you know stingers in the water as well as other arsy na nasty things in the water so yeah there's so many complexities to it. a lot of it was on the water and then there's a yeah stuff that we shot in a huge big uh, prawn farm dam on the gold coast and then there's a big water tank that we had and then there's the other water the um like the, the, the there's a big tank near the brisbane airport which is like a safety training sort of facility so there's that and oh there's just a so many locations that you're dealing with like a, a lot of films and then in the edit suite you're just you're patching it all together and hoping it all holds up set yourself quite a challenge for a first feature <laughs> yeah yeah well as i said you jump in head first and mm. you know um uh, you know, so a little bit of ignorance is a bl is bliss, probably, because um, <laughs> yeah. you're still wondering how you did it in 25 days, and you're looking back, and your head is still spinning. Um, but uh, yeah, it is. You know, a lot of people certainly understand the challenges of water, and and uh, you know, even you're shooting in tanks and things like that. You know, you you, for example, you change a you want to change a lens. I mean, that could be a half an hour exercise of getting the camera out of its housing and then putting the lens on and putting it back in the water and then getting all the divers ready then the actors prepped it's a it's such an exercise are you, uh, are you a water person yourself do you get in the water much oh look i'm like any growing up in perth you know obviously you just and it's hot and in the summer it's it's all about going to the beach or going into the pool so i'm not a, a crazy surfer or anything but i like many australians i'm, I'm I'm sort of well versed and grew up in the water, grew up on the coast. So, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, some of these films, I guess, show too much shark and then some don't show enough. Was there much debate on how far you guys would take it? Oh, you just, 
<laughs> Sometimes when you finish the movie, you don't know. Um, I don't know it's like I, I think, like personally, I think you, you hit a nice balance. Um, but yes, you know, there must be discussion on how far, absolutely, you, you know, how much you show. Yeah, there always is. I mean, you know, and you're trying to, and you are, you're trying to find the balance. And and as filmmakers and everything, you, you just you get so close to the material, and you know, so um, I'm I'm glad you feel that we we sort of got there in the end that we did get a bit of a get the balance right but it's just always always um yeah it's always tricky yeah for sure um and look finally i just want to talk about real quick um your lead actress katrina bowden um she's no stranger to horror movies in fact she's been in creature features herself including like piranha three double d did her experience in creature features give an advantage you know above the others well i think is such a great professional uh, on the genre element she's a very a very good actor absolutely just threw herself into the part and it was a very very demanding part because you're in the as we discussed you're in the water you're coming to a new country um so and that's scary and but she was uh and she just she was absolute to use an aussie word she was an absolute trooper she just really wanted to get her hands dirty wanted to to um you know really embrace the action and the genre that she was in and i think it comes across that way so I um, mean, she's, yeah, she's really proud of what she's done. And so am I. I was like, yeah, like she's, she, she really, um, she really knows her craft. For sure. She, she added a, um, a whole lot of depth, definitely, you know, amongst that. Uh, there's a good dynamic amongst all the characters, but she certainly, she was the Thank heart you. of the, the story. For oh, sure. absolutely. Critical. Her experience that she brings, um, you know, does, does come through and it's right in her wheelhouse. So yeah. 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 Fantastic, and, that, and that's not to diminish the performance of the others too, because it is really um, a nice ensemble, particularly when they're all spending most of the time on a life raft together. <laughs> anyway, um, look, you know that's you know about all I've got time for. But look, I just want to say congratulations um, Thanks, on the man. film. Um, look, it, it's for everybody um, that's listening or watching. Um, it's available on all major digital platforms that are uh, dropped on June thirty. So, thanks again, and um, good luck. Thanks, with it. Lane. Thanks, mate. Awesome. Good stuff. Um, thank you to Martin for making the time and a big shout out to Universal Pictures and Stack Magazine for helping to make that one come together. If you're one of the cool kids like us, DVD and Blu-ray will be coming along next week on July 7th. Boneheads. Now we have to make sure we talk really slow because Ben has trouble with our accents if you've been listening to his show. So welcome to a fun size episode of Bonehead Weekly. Hi. That's okay, because we're going to talk about sharks this week and some of our favorite shark movies. And I, we know everybody in Australia has been, by, been bitten by a shark. They've all been bitten by one. sharks and poisonous snakes. They've got those put the shit like cages outside on their beaches to go on their beach, right? Yeah, they got all dead. All, Wait, all the, are, the and they're all is. descended from from murderers I, and thieves. are you are you they got saying the four that S's. Australia, are you saying that australia is where the were sharks are where shark their but, shark james oh <laughs> why are you talking like that like, but they got was, they do they got the ben could court. understand us <laughs> they, yeah. go ahead jad no i was just gonna where say they the got the de- they got the deadly four s's sharks snakes sun uh uh spiders and skin cancer Doo-doo. You know, I, I wanted to actually, I tried to do this seriously. And Why? It, it spiraled me down into this cavern. And now there's a series of was movies. Was there sharks in that, it? I, I, there might as well be, because there's a series of movies I'm going to have to watch that I somehow missed. And it's the, of the oeuvre of multi-headed sharks. You have to say that slower, like Chad said, because Ben can't understand. Not tortured, and I'm going to talk about that sometime too. too. Anyway, no. authentic frontier, <laughs> frontier gibberish. gibberish. No, I, I, so I, until I started researching this, I did not know there was a two-headed shark attack, and that, that spawned three spinoffs. And what I want to know is, yes. it goes two-headed shark attack. Three-headed shark attack, five-headed shark attack. What happened to five, four? What four? Like, is that one I can write? Because the guy who wrote is that right? Ben won't attack, be able to understand that. Now, uh, uh-uh. I've done, I've say, done messed that, up. Royal. That is penmanship. And now I've got to get into this entire genre. I did not know the monster shark for the first one was built by Cleve Hall, and yes. that automatically the made late me great uh, Cleve Hall. Are you done? 
Yeah, I was waiting for y'all. Okay, Chad, we go. We have so much time. All right, I am going to talk about a shark movie um, that is, it tells the the, 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 the the old story of how Christmas goes. Boy has family Christmas. Boy doesn't like family. Boy gets magic German pen from family. Draws a shark with a, that is uh, powered by the, after it eats an evil Santa. And then we end up with Santa Jaws. I watched this piece of crap for this five minute segment. <laughs> Why did you do it, that? Because I like to torture myself. <laughs> Is there a theme song? Because I think no, there should be. So, so let, let's, let's, let's break down Santa Jaws real quick. So Santa Jaws eats evil Santa, gains evil Santa's powers. He wears his hat on his fin. He is wrapped in Christmas lights. His teeth are made of broken ornaments. And whenever, whenever he's getting ready to attack, you hear jingle bells coming out of the Well, water. now I've got to watch Santa Jaws. Thank you very much, you bastard. It's like the bad Santa of shark movies. All right. Well, I'll go really quick. So here's the thing. We're back to Jaws is one of my favorite movies of all time. I literally named my son Quint. Quint is not in Santa Jaws. No. Well, that's okay. Good. We do not want to be smirched the name. Now, everybody talks about how Jaws 3 and 4 suck, and they do. But I think Jaws 2 is worse. And this is an unpopular opinion. You want to know why? Jaws 2 is boring as hell. You know what Jaws 3 and 4 are not? Boring as hell. Boring as hell. They're dumb as hell. And Jaws 4 has Mario Van, Van Peebles. Yeah. Which and which and Michael, Michael Caine. Okay. Because he bought a house. I think. He bought a house with his money. Michael Caine got from Jaws 4. And the shark screams like a damned T-Rex at the end when it's being attacked and being shocked before it blows up. Right? Which which is right. for all we know is completely wrong. I mean, we don't know what a dinosaur. I, oh, like I thought you were about to say we don't know what a shark screams like, James. And I was about to say, I'm pretty sure we know sharks don't scream. We can't assume that there's not sharks. Sharks there only cry. Oh, hold on, sharks when the doves cry. I for, I was totally screwed that up. Well, but, they when they bat when they fight the jets, they yeah, cry. Yeah, shark and the jets. So unpopular opinion jaws 2 sucks jaws 3 and 4 are at least not boring this I'm has Michael been bonehead Payne. thank you for joining us hi ben i Ooh. hope you understand us now oh. mountain dew they really are boneheads do like they have got it in for you right now do they i didn't understand a word they said <laughs> <laughs> do they too, did they talk about me bit too fast or just a bit yokel I, I was just, it's just, yeah. I don't, <laughs> what, what were you going to say? <laughs> it's just, it's a, wah, wah. it's like the teacher in Charlie Brown. Whiskey. Taking on today's theme, uh, that would be Joe, Chad and James. Uh, Bonehead Weekly is the name of their show. So find that wherever you get podcasts from. Uh, ben, I'm going to take us back to the year of our births, mate. 1979. Technically not a shark movie, but close enough that I'm going to do it. Um, it's, it's the same as all the rest, but it's not Barracuda. So <laughs> if that's on your list, we're not going to cross, cross hairs there. No. I'm talking about the Roger Corman Jaws ripoff that is not Piranha. It is Up From The Depths. Have you seen this one? It is a beauty. No, is this the one where it's the shark-like creature? It is a shark that comes up from prehistoric crevices in the bottom of the ocean, and it's a big blue rubber fucking thing with bulgy yeah. eyes. It is stupid. Um, <laughs> it, it terrorizes an exclusive sort of rich person's island resort, but this resort is just a beach with some umbrellas. Like, there is no evidence of the resort itself. You just only ever see the beach with the rich people on it. And the best scene is at the start where this really rich guy goes for a swim. And moments before, we've seen a scene of a woman being completely, like, torn to shreds by a shark. And then it cuts to the next scene, rich guy in the water, and he comes up to the surface and swims through her intestines. And he comes out of the water with her guts <laughs> dripped all over him. And what's even Jeez. funnier is that he gets out of the water walks all the way 100 metres across the beach complaining about this shit all over him to a shower. He was in the fucking in water the to water. begin with. <laughs> that was, that, that's, that's me as a kid like going, why are there showers on the beach? Like those outside showers? <laughs> like you, the, the water's just the water's just there. I get the like, feet I taps, but I, not didn't the, underst- I didn't understand it. The, the but salt, me, it's the salt. Let me ask you this. So yep. this is a Roger Corman film. Yep. It's stupid, but I mean, the, the <laughs> test, the real test... To, to any Roger Corman drive-in film is, can you imagine yourself 
watching it while you're getting a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Because if like if that's the kind of film it is, then it's it's done its job. Totally. Um, it's it, because like it, there's so or much. Or giving a blowjob if that's your thing. I mean, there's a reasonable production value to this, but um, Sam Bottoms is in it too. I might add, brother of Timothy Bottoms. Timothy Bottoms. Uh, and he made this directly after coming off the set of Apocalypse Now. So what a juxtaposition. I'm sure there was a. <laughs> I'm sure it was a. a a much better run set. <laughs> it was probably a relief, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so much overacting. Um, the int- what I find hilarious is that the director, Charles B. Griffith, has openly said that when he started making this movie, it was a monster movie, and <laughs> the creature arrives on set, and it's so stupid that the whole entire crew gets really dejected about what they're doing, and he just stopped in his tracks and said, right, we're making a comedy. So then they made a comedy. Yeah. And he didn't know until the release night that Roger Corman had cut it right back into a, a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he had no idea. And it just looks dumb. But uh, look, I like this kind of dumb. It just really pleases me. But I want to share a moment that I just love. Right towards the end, it's the big attack, you know. It finally hits the you know the actual beachfront area where people are swimming. And the whole place turns into pan- um, pandemonium. There's people running, they're tripping over each other. You know, you think there's a fucking you know, tsunami coming. And then suddenly this married couple stop in their tracks and the guy just holds her by the shoulders and says, honey, it's fine. Fish can't walk, right? So all these people are running and she stops. She says, but everybody's running. And he goes, fish can't run either. And that pretty much sums <laughs> up the whole film and how stupid it is that once you're on land, there's no threat. Yeah. But they, well, but, but they felt that they had to create this kind of environment of like panic. Yeah, that's it's it's funny you mention that. Like I, I, because James did kind of mention all the two headed and three headed shark attack and six headed shark attack movies <laughs> that I had planned to just talk about just those. Yeah, right. On the show, and so then when he one, mentioned two, it, yeah. one, two, three, I was going to go up and like he's like just skip four. Yeah, but <laughs> I had to I had to kind of um, you know kind of forego that. But in both of them, in two headed shark, the two that I kind of. The two, the two headed shark and three headed shark. The first, the first one, they're they're on an atoll, which is like a kind of landmass on top of a reef kind of thing. Yeah. And you, you first, you're like, why are they all scared? They're like literally on land, but then because of all of the sharks' activity, and he's like, there is a giant shark. It's screwing up the reef, so it's actually the atoll is sinking. Yeah. Hundred percent makes sense. Yep. In the in three headed shark, <laughs> they're a group. They're scientists. So they know they're literally <laughs> on an island and they're still like freaking out. And you're like, but you're on an island. You're safe. You're safe. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like what is the, pa- like, I mean, maybe you don't have a radio, but I think they do. Like, they've got one on their boat. It's just, it's just so ridiculous. You're like, I mean, oh, hang, I love you. Say, it's just so ridiculous. Hang on. Three headed shark three attack. Headed shark. It's just so ridiculous. Yeah. And the thing, well, the, <laughs> The trick to, to three-headed shark attack is <laughs> Danny Trejo's in it. And, uh, of course, he um, he hacks off one of the shark's heads with a machete. Of course he does. Because it's Why Danny not? Trejo. Yeah. What else is he going to do? <laughs> but then three heads spurt, grow out of the single spot with a head. So it's a five-headed shark. So it's shark. actually a five-headed shark, but yeah. it's not called five-headed shark. And they seem to compl- they forget that in, <laughs> and they still go into four-headed shark. And you're like, well, what happened to the, th- yeah. What happened to the three-headed, the, the, you know, the maybe five-headed the, maybe, shark? Maybe it was a prequel. Yeah. And then when you get to five-headed <laughs> shark, and that's what I like, like six-headed shark and five, they're like, it's, it's like a diamond shaped shark. Like two-headed shark has some great, <laughs> like the first kill is two, um, two skiers hanging off the back of a boat. <laughs> and they're like, you know, they're kind of, you know, kind of skiing next to each other. And I guess, I think it's two girls. I can't remember. They're high-fiving each other, whatever it is. And then the shark jumps out of the water and one head on like, you know, each for each <laughs> of the, like it's a clever use of the two-headed shark. Yep. Like it's a good kill. Yeah. They don't, they don't do that again, really. <laughs> Way too much time yeah. talking about multi-headed Multi- sharks. It's a, it's a, yeah. Do you have, do you actually have another one lined up? I do. I, I have to admit, my last one is a bit of a screw up because <laughs> because I had planned to do all of the the two headed three headed thing. I was caught a bit flat footed because uh, I only I only heard the bonehead uh, segment kind of late yeah. late during the week. So I was watching this today, and for some reason, like I I was looking at all of the shark movies that I had on um, I had on my computer, 
and then I like I was like, oh no, I'm not. They were they were funnily enough all asylum films. Yep. And it's actually quite frustrating because all of the asylum the as- asylum films they cut them for Sci-Fi Channel. Yeah. So they cut all the nudity and swearing out of them, <laughs> but the the physical releases on in the for the European market are full of it. Yep. It, it, they're amazing. So it was, they're frustrating to watch because you know <laughs> they've cut around it. And some points you, they've clearly zoomed in, so the quality drops Ugh. in the in the cut-ins. Bloody sci-fi channel. Um, <laughs> I thought, okay, I can't do none of the ones with shark in the. I just typed in shark into the search and yeah, right. And then I was like, no, the reef. I'll have a look at the reef. That's a <laughs> shark movie. Bring up the reef. And but the other movie that came up was Into the Blue Two, the reef. And I was like, fuck, I've been, like, I loved Into the Blue and I had a major crush on Laura Vandervoort uh, to, from Smallville's Supergirl, <laughs> who's the star of uh, Into the Blue 2. I was like, I'll watch that. I get, you know, 40, 50 minutes into it. It's about four o'clock this evening before, uh, you know, <laughs> I have to leave at 5.30 to, to get here. Yeah. And uh, not a single shark. <laughs> You would have been better off watching the reef, the animated film. The animated, yeah, that's right. That has sharks. That, in that it. has sharks in it. This, uh, I mean, I could have watched. I could have even watched like zombie flesh eaters. At least there's a zombie versus shark scene in that. Exactly. There is zero. Like sharks do not even get mentioned, despite the fact that this is a and it's usually a trope of treasure hunting movies. Like it is an oceanic treasure hunting film. Yeah. <laughs> and it does, as I mentioned, Laura Vandervoort and. Uh, uh, what's his name? Chris Carmack, who I remember he's he always plays like a jerk. Yep. He's like a he's a you know kind of square jawed, uh, like blue eyed American boy kind of type. And he's in like he's the asshole uh, Marissa's asshole boyfriend in the OC, and he's in uh, <laughs> Love is it Love Wreck? <laughs> no. That um, what's that movie with um, Amanda Bynes? The one where she gets trapped on the desert island with her crush, and he turns out to be a, a Love wrecked. Is it love wrecked? Yeah, I think it might one. be. Yeah. Why do I know that? So they're the couple that, because I think in the original it's um, it's Jessica. I can't remember her name now. <laughs> the one from Sin City. What's her name? Jessica Alba. Jessica Alba. Yeah. Jessica Alba and Paul Walker are the other main yeah, ones course, in the original. Course, one. Yeah. And then they've got their friends. Is I think direct, it's Scott Kahn and by John Stockwell. I believe so. And this one, this one actually, the guy who directed this is Stephen Herrick, who has like a fantastic track record. Bill and track Ted. Record with Bill and Ted, Critters, Mr. Holland's Opus. Yeah, but didn't he then just spiral into that like country trilogy or whatever? Like he, he's done an ice skating film. Did he, Ice Princess? No, no. You know, what's that famous ice skating film and that had like directed to DVD sequels? I can't remember the name of it. Breaking the Ice? No, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Cut, uh, cutting, no. Uh, cutting the Edge? Cutting Edge? Yeah, is it maybe coming? I don't know. With with deep with, I mean, if it's the one with DB Sweeney and uh, <laughs> Moira Kelly, I fucking love that film, and it does have a bunch of shit sequels. But the first one is is like one of my all time favorite movies. All right, I'm gonna look it up. So feel free to keep talking. I think it actually might be if you go to my letterbox, it may be in my top five films kind of kind of list. But anyway, but um, for fuck's sake, who even cares? So it also stars uh, Marsha Thomason from Black Knight, mm-hmm. and one of my favourite TV series that I think only they only have aired six episodes of called Easy Money. It's not to be uh, confused with that more recent Easy TV series where everyone's having sex with each other. And it, it was the cutting edge, far enough. It ice. was the cutting edge. Yeah, I yeah, I love that. Plus, I love that. But he also did the Three Musketeers for Disney, which I I love that film. He also made two Dolly Dolly Parton films. So <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Which one? Like did he, Rhinestone. <laughs> he did the Coat of Many Colors, which is you know one of the hallmark ones, I think. And um, Christmas of Many Colors. <laughs> Christmas of Many Colors. <laughs> Great. I mean, it's a shame he didn't do like he didn't do Rhinestone because that Sylvester Stallone singing uh, dr- "They Call Me Drunken Stein" is possibly one of the greatest moments of possibly. It is one of the greatest moments <laughs> of cinema. We can we can we can connect him back to uh, shark movies because well he, he did Critters as well. Let's not yeah, forget cri- that. I mentioned Critters. Yes, of course you did. Uh, he did Mr. Holland's Opus with Richard Dreyfuss, who was in Jaws. So. He was in Jaws, yeah. So you chose wisely. I chose what? Well, yeah, I chose well. Uh, my. <laughs> It's also got uh, it, it ha- and this movie is great like it, because it is a seemingly DTV um, sequel yeah it is chock full of nudity 
there's a lot of like there's a lot of violence in it. Yeah. Like it it actually is like it is a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I enjoyed it a lot more than I enjoyed the original uh, Into the Blue. Into the Blue. Cool. Um, definitely worth checking out. Like awesome. uh, I think it's. I I know the first one. Haven't seen the second. I think there's a third. Maybe a fourth hey, one. Hey, I'm the guy who loves number twos, mate. I'm on it. I will get there. Um, now let's uh, let's throw to Adam. Uh, he's he's obsessed with dicks. <laughs> hey guys, it's Adam here from Adam's Just Seen and Triple M with another good movie Monday recommendation. This week we're doing shark movies. Now I've got permission from Glenn to go a little bit adjacent to that and to cover anything that could be in the water that could eat you. And so going with that guide, I'm going to go with Piranha 3D. Director Alexandra Arja has always been a filmmaker that I have taken notice of, and I really, really love his film Crawl from a couple of years ago. That's one of my favourite creature features of all time. But where that was a deadly serious pressure cooker of a film, Piranha 3D is just, you know, a completely unapologetic B-movie. Uh, this movie starts with a cameo from Mr. Richard Dreyfus himself, star of the greatest shark movie of all time Jaws and the movie basically you know it takes him down the gurgler really quickly and lets you know that you know that nothing is kind of off the table in this movie including Mr. Jerry O'Connell yeah from Sliders getting his penis bitten off at one stage now this movie came out around the repopularization of 3D and I remember (laughs) thinking to myself in the cinema going is this what James Cameron had in mind when I'm watching a floating penis get snapped up by piranhas? But, you know, but what the hell? RJ here has just, you know, basically takes this really basic premise of cracking the ocean floor open and having these ravenous piranhas be released around this most obnoxious of events, spring break. And I remember around COVID time that there were a lot of people that were, you know, partying in spring break, disregarding public safety. And everyone's like, Ugh. and so if you need a little bit of catharsis from that, obnoxiousness watch this movie and watch them all get torn to shreds by the piranhas um this has a surprisingly like you know a high level cast you've got elizabeth shoe you know incredible actress headlining here adam scott in a leading role and look i mean i think that he's on everyone's radar because of uh, parks and rec and party down if you haven't checked that out watch that and mr ving rames i think that you know if you're in any kind of apocalyptic situation you need ving rames and you need a shotgun and then your chance of survival is about 50% better. Um, this also has a bunch of uh, porn stars in it as well. So who would have ever guessed that, you know, Mr. Richard Dreyfus would be sharing the screen with people like Riley Steele. But <laughs> I think that that's the kind of movie that Arja is going for here. So, yeah, if you want, you know, like a silly, you know, fun B movie with uh, 3D penises being bitten off, I don't think you can do better than Piranha 3D. I guess I don't really need to say it again, because I said at the start, but that is Adam Ross, and he is the chairman of the Australian Film Critics Association. You can hear him every week on Triple M. His Facebook page is Adam's Just Seen, so go ahead and give that a like too. All right. Um, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I've got one to go, and you're all done. You're I'm done. Up. Okay, so <laughs> if you cross Sequest DSV with Flipper and then throw in a bit of Free Willy, you will end up with one of the lamest excuses for a horror film of all time, Mako Jaws of Death. <laughs> I'll tell you what, ironically... I, don't know, I love all of the things that you said you, that, that go into this. <laughs> wow, this is weird. Like This one was actually, to its credit, written before Jaws came along. And it was so absurd and stupid, no one wanted it. But then, obviously, Jaws came along and the studio was looking for a shark-related movie. But um, this one's all about a guy who can talk to sharks, right? It's about... <laughs> he swims with them, he confides in them, he practically cuddles them. And so he's dedicated his life to being their sole protector. Right. right. So he he's the villain. The sharks are the good people, or the good you no know, monsters. Oh, the victims. The victims and humans are the real monsters. And it begins with a scene where people are diving, trying to spear sharks and all that kind of stuff. And he is waiting for them at the bottom with a scuba gear and and sort of turns the spear back on them and hooks them through the mouth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the people. <laughs> the people. Yeah, yeah. the people. Like, he fish hooks them. Yeah, he fish hooks them. So yeah. when you reel it in, you're reeling in the you know the person. Uh, it's just so fucking absurd. You know, he goes home and he talks to the fish in his aquarium, and they apparently talk back because he's having a conversation with them. Right. I'll tell you is what. it like like <laughs> like when uh, Anchorman Will Ferrell is having talking to his dog? <laughs> No, I'm impressed. You <laughs> ate a whole wheel of cheese? No, I'm not upset. I'm well, it pretty impressed. much is because he says, you know, hey, Mindy, how's it going? And no, she's just looking at him like Flipper does. Right. It's a shark, though. Uh-uh. <laughs> it's just a shark. And he's going, oh, well, that's too bad. Like, <laughs> he says, well, say hi to Marion for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
the shark swims away. And like, it's not really a horror film in any way, but it's so absurd. You just got to watch it. And um, <laughs> there's a scene where he, he walks into his, uh, it's either his kitchen or someone else's kitchen. And there's a dead fish on the floor and he picks it up and cries and he mourns it. And it's like, just it's like a fish from like the fishmonger. And yeah, right. he has this moment and the, the, the scene is very emotional. Well, imagine being that guy who acted that role. I can't remember what his name is, but fuck me dead. This is a new level of absurd, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Canon film. It's from the Canon catalog. And it, Oh, no, that's right. His name. I've got it written down here. It is Richard Jackal. Who, Richard Jekyll from Jekyll. Dirty Dozen and uh, The Outfit. Yeah, which I'm not familiar with his work, right? I, I, I've seen He's films great. with him in it, but I don't know him as a, as a player. Yeah. Um, so it also has Harold Sakata as well from uh, James Bond, Odd Job. Odd Job. Um, I'll tell you what, directed by William Greff, who made Whiskey Mountain, Impulse and Sting of Death. And um, just you've just got to see it. I will give you the tagline or the quote on the front of the poster just because they knew it was not a horror film per se, so they had to make it look like one. <laughs> the poster says in caps sheer terror and then beneath it filmed without the benefit of cages mechanical sharks or other protective devices and to its credit all the shark sequences are filmed with humans and sharks but they are the most fucking docile sharks I reckon they drug them or something like they're just yeah, right. flopping around they're kind of just like buoyant <laughs> like gummy sharks or whatever they're just completely not interested in people well, they kind of look like dangerous sharks but they're buoyant they're not moving like they're just sort of just floating there slowly wriggling <laughs> Yeah, well, they, they didn't realise is they chucked a couple of hand grenades into the water beforehand <laughs> and they're all dead. They're all just like, it's like no, no, no. Like, let's wait the shark so at least it floats the right way around. So I hope that, like, I've, I have, I've definitely been honest in saying it's a terrible film, but it's that brand of terrible that you just have to see. It's a beautiful slice of schlock. And, um, yeah, not comparable to Jaws in any way, but it came off the <laughs> It back. was ready to go. That's what's, <laughs> yeah. that's what's important. That's right. They'd, it'd been budgeted, it'd been written, it'd been cast. They're like, got a green light, let's do it. Oh, we've entered the the last leg, unless you're a victim of a shark, and you might not have any legs. <laughs> that guy that you talked about. Yeah. Floating to the bottom of the... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Taking all... Like, there's quite a few scenes in the film where they, he rips people in <laughs> half. Like, and so, they, like, he's got... It's, it's great, like... I mean, who, the special effects are pretty amazing in Tateria. But, like, he grabs the, the head of, like, a, a bikini babe, uh, for lack of a better way to describe her. And, like, it's it's like you the, the, the shark's flinging, flinging around with just the top half and blood streaming down everywhere. Like, he, he does he does come off... People are... I don't know how to explain it. They, they're, conveniently, they're very convenient in the way that they he, a shark comes up to them in the water. Like, so he can... For the most part, he swallows their legs and then just kind of bites it off and leaves their top half. Because I think at one point, uh, Hugo Stiglitz grabs the girl after she's been bitten by the shark and he's trying to swim it ashore. And I'm like, dude, it, it's too late. The shark? He's literally, like, you're just pulling a guts in. Like, well, the shark sounds like a geometry major. He's got the right angle. You know, yeah. He comes in. <laughs> but then though, the shark the shark is like, fuck you, buddy. Yeah. You're not taking this girl. That's my dinner. And he comes in and, like, doesn't go for Hugo Stiglitz, just gets the half girl, mm. pulls him out of his arms. It's a... <laughs> Fuck, it's an amazing film. Well, I, I honestly, I, I got to admit, like, I don't want to watch another shark movie again for a little while. Well, I want to watch some of the ones that you brought. Well, up. Who am I kidding? I'll probably watch Ouija Shark tomorrow. Yeah, or Shark Exorcist. <laughs> well, the Shark Exorcist, Toxic Shark. What about Shark Alanche? Raiders Jesus. of the Lost Shark, Shark to Puss, House Sky, Shark. We could have watched Sky Sharks. I didn't even think of Sky Sharks. I mean, I have interviewed the director, but uh, Shark and Stein. Shark and yeah, mate. <laughs> shark Well, anyway. Shark. I mean, yeah. Mega Megalodon versus uh, Shark to Puss. Far out. There is. There's a. There's got to be another episode. I mean, what a great, <laughs> what a great concept. Like half shark, half octo- octopus. That's been Shark to Puss. Shark to Puss. Yeah. 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 Like, uh, it, it, you're saying that's I'm a genius saying, film. Yeah. I'm saying it's a great idea. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's Asylum, so it's terrible, but it's a, it's a genius idea. Well, I guess we could talk about this all day, <laughs> <laughs> but let's not. Time to sign off. Um, some of the folks that help us along the way are Four Pillars Gin, Eagle Entertainment, Astor Theatre, Luna Driving, Umbrella Entertainment, and uh, find them all on social media and support them because they support us. And don't forget to follow us on Letterboxd where we list all of the films that we talk about. I mean, the major films now. Like, we've changed changed a bit. I did, at one point, <laughs> we were listing every single film that got even a r- most random uh, brief mention. 
<laughs> and it started getting a bit ridiculous. I think we, our lists were something like 170 films long. It was an arduous affair. It was a, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's much easier now. There's only like nine films. But I, I tell you what, you've got some doozies to look up uh, for this episode, people, because, you know... Watch them all. Cool. Have your own Shark Week. Uh, while we're at it, we do have a new website. So find uh, all of our shows and all of our videos. You can visit goodmoviemonday.com. So it's a brand new place. It's still a work in process. Lots to come, though. We'll have competitions there as well. Speaking of competitions, we do have giveaways to come on our social media pages, including passes to Palace Cinema, which does include Astor Theatre. We've got DVDs and Blu-rays, plus some award-winning gin to boot. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Swinging back to our mates, Jarrett Garn, Guillermo Troncoso, Adam Ross, wah, 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 and wah. Again, they are the Bonehead Weekly guys. And uh, show them some love on uh, social media. And lots of love, of course, to our friend Tia, who helps us with social media. She puts a lot of work into what she does, and we do appreciate it. And Ben, then there's you. I can take or leave you. Uh, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I can take or leave myself. <laughs> the show wouldn't amount to much without you, mate. Thank you for another good one. Oh, you're more than welcome. How's about a uh, New Zealand shark attack? How do you feel about that? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I just if, now that you've said, it, I just think of that ad, but it's a whale that <laughs> beached as bro. <laughs> well, oh, bro can, can I have a chip? <laughs> oh, I'm beached as beached as bro. <laughs> well, we're going to leave you with a song called "Shark Attack" by Split Ends. It's an absolute banger, and we'll catch you next week.
Yeah. <laughs>